Hey, greetings, Atlanta from uh, Yerushalayim. It's not exactly sunny, it's a bit dark out at this point, but uh, the spring seems to be arriving. So if you're thinking about visiting anytime soon, it's a great time to come, weather is gorgeous. Uh, our topic tonight is the sixth of the 13 Ikarim of the Ramam on Nebuah, uh, on Emuna, and that, that is the one that concerns itself with Nebua. The Rambam, when he discusses Nebuah, he actually starts uh, describing the level that actually comes below Nebuah, which is Ruch HaKodesh. And the way that one achieves that is by perfecting basically your character, your understanding, and your focus. And what you're basically doing is you're developing a self that resonates with a higher level of understanding. And by connecting in that way through that resonance, you're able to receive from uh, another realm uh, understanding. That's Ruch HaKodesh. That's something that a person is able to actually achieve. Nevuah is actually something that you receive and it's next level up beyond the preparation that you would need for Ruch HaKodesh. There's a certain Dvekas and a Kodesh Baruch that's required and a person prepares themselves to receive Nevuah and either a Kodesh Baruch gifts them with it or doesn't. But the bottom line is Ruch HaKodesh and Nevuah are both processes where we receive understanding from a whole nother realm, from the spiritual realm. And uh, the Ramam says a person who ex experiences Ruch HaKodesh or Nebuah is basically separated out from the rest of humanity because having had that experience, they really are living on, they're living in this world, or actually the way I like it is they're living through this world rather than in this world. They're really connected to a whole nother place. We get some kind of a, an idea of what it means to connect to another realm when we have what's known as the aha moment, right? The, uh, there are authors that write about Nobel Prize winners asking, interviewing them, asking them when they actually got the insight for the idea for which they won the prize. They talk about the fact that they were working on the problem for many, many years. And then at some point when they're getting on a bus, they remember lifting up their foot and suddenly the thing was there. That intuition, that inspiration that we get, which is the foundation of any great idea, we don't know where that comes from. Uh, it comes from a place which is beyond comprehension. Uh, in our day, because of our focus on the rational intellect, we take that insight and we immediately start processing it and basically forget the fact that we're building on a connection to something which goes beyond our comprehension. Uh, so we really are very much focused in what we grasp as opposed to the fact that it's building on something which goes beyond us. But uh, even when we're talking on this level, we're talking when we're talking about normal, 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 a normal context. You may be connected to something which is beyond your comprehension, but it's still part of the finite world that we occupy. When we're talking about prophecy, what we're talking about is when you're able to reach a level which really transcends this. This is really the roots of reality, the spiritual roots of reality. Major difference between the Torah view versus the Western view is that we, the Western view is that reality is located in physical and any ideas or understanding comprehension is something which is our interpretation that goes on top of that. The Torah looks at it the opposite. The spiritual entities that are, are being actualized through physical reality are really the roots of reality. That's where reality really lies. The whole, and the whole point, the, the physical is nothing more than the realm of its expression. And the idea of Navua is that you manage to reach that realm which is beyond uh, the realm that we occupy and have access to insight, which is coming from the roots, uh, the spiritual roots of reality, and that results in Nevoa. There are different levels of Nevoa. Uh, our topic is not that of Moshe Rabbeinu, that'll presumably be the next class, but uh, the Nevoa of Moshe Rabbeinu is something that gives us access to actually mitzvahs themselves, it's a whole other level, that's Torah. Once Moshe's gone, <clears throat> Torah's Moshe, that's over, right? We don't, we don't get that anymore, but Nevoa is still around, giving us tochacha, giving us insights, into uh, the future, giving us insights into El Kaddish Baruch Hu's viewing and what he wants from us, and that we do have. The mitzvah, there's a mitzvah to believe in Navi, who's in Navi MS. Uh, that's a separate issue, how it is you identify who the Navi MS is. We have a mitzvah to believe the Navi MS when he comes along, but that's not our, that's not our focus today. Our focus today is the Ikar of Amunah, which is that we need to believe that Navua exists in humanity, that there is such a thing as Navua. We're looking now again at the sixth of the 13 principles of the Rambam. This actually is an important transition point in your course of study here uh, in that this is really 
another category of ikar. Rambam has 13 ikarim, but the Sefer ikarim, so there's a Sefer called Sefer ikarim by Yosef Albo, also a Rishon, who whittles down the essentials of Amuna down to the basic three. They are uh, the Metzius of Hashem, that God, that God exists. They are that, that, that Torah is shamayim, that there's communication from beyond this world, and Hashkacha, reward and punishment, that God intervenes in the world. Again, God exists, number one. Number two, he communicates with the world, he communicates with humanity. And number three is that he intervenes. If we look at those as categories, as opposed to specific uh, ideas, then the 13 principles of the Rambam fit quite nicely into these three categories of the Sefer Ikarim. We can look at the, really all the Ikarim that you've been doing up until now, the first five all would be broadly under the rubric of the Metzius Hashem, the existence of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. God exists, he's unitary, right? He's not physical, he's prior, he's eternal, and he has complete and absolute control, so therefore there's no point in worshiping or davening to anything but a Kaddish Baruch Hu. All those have to do with the nature of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. We can put those first five in that category relating to what the, what the Sefer Karim calls the focus of the Metzius of Hashem, the existence of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. The next four, beginning with the Iker that we're on now, Nebuah, all have to do with the communication between a Kaddish Baruch Hu and humanity. Number one, Nebuah exists. Number two, Moshe's Rabbeinu, Moshe, the Nebuah of Moshe was unique and unprecedented and will not, we, we won't, we'll never come, we'll never come back. We, there'll be no other Nabi like that. The third is the Torah is Mina Shamayim, and that finally the Torah is complete and eternal. Those are all those four. The next four Ikarma are all going to be, are all going to fit into that larger rubric of Kaddish Baruch's communication with Adam. And then the final four we could classify under the Hashgacha of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, reward and punishment intervention. He knows what's happening in the world. He does. He gives reward and punishes. He will bring the Mashiach and eventually comes Tchiyas Amesim. So that's, that's the 13. So we can group them this way. It's helpful to sort of step back a little bit and get the, the, the broader vision. The, 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 it's, it, it, if you look at it that way, it gives you a way of kind of rationally understanding why these make sense. The Ikar of all the Ikarim is obviously that a Kaddish Baruch Hu, the creator exists. Uh, all the synopses of the, of the principles of the Ramam always use the word creator. Uh, and in the translation that we have, uh, the standard translation of the Paris Mishnah, so also we talk about the existence of a creator. Once you are relating to the concept of creation, we cannot understand creation unless there's purpose. So if we recognize that there is a creator, we recognize he created with purpose. What was that purpose? If the purpose was the creation of some thing, like a work of art or something that would uh, show his wisdom, then that's something that Kaddish can do instantly. So that we would not, that, that does not require any kind of a process, but we do experience creation as unfolding in time, right? Through process. If that process was a purely mechanical one, then the fact that it has to unfold doesn't really make any sense. You're just, what's gonna happen is gonna happen inevitably anyway. What's the point of it happening through time? Yet we do experience creation as unfolding through time. That's because creation is not mechanical. It is not determined because included in the creation, as we can obviously observe, is Adam, is man with his free will. The path of creation is basically, the process of creation is basically man utilizing that capacity of free will, making choices, creating himself, finishing his world. And the whole idea behind that is that uh, would be a whole separate share and so right? We don't really need to go into it now. But the bottom line is, if man is making choices and the world is supposed to get someplace, then we need direction to know what it is that we're supposed to be doing. We are not able to comprehend God. We can't comprehend the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and therefore we can't understand his intentions. It's easy enough to recognize just how profoundly different or beyond this Kaddish Baruch Hu is, the way that I always do it with my students is, I challenge you to create something from nothing. Right, we wreck that so beyond the scope of anything that we could imagine. We immediately no 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 one would take no one would, no one would accept the challenge. Right, it's obvious that that can't be done. Rish Baruch Hu creates creation something from nothing, completely different from us. Furthermore, we've already done the ikar. The Kaddish Baruch Hu is unitary. Right, we comprehend through making distinctions. That's the process of human understanding is making distinctions. We cannot, by definition, comprehend 
and all-encompassing unity, we need to break things down to understand them. So we can't understand the Kaddish Baruch It's a completely different realm, level of existence. If we can't understand the Kaddish Baruch then we can't expect to know what his purpose is in creation. We need direction. And that's where the necessity of Nebuah comes in. Once Adam is part of the picture, with his free will, even with direction, he still has free will. So therefore, it, it's, it, since creation is with a purpose and the Kaddish Baruch is created with the intention that it should arrive at that purpose, Kaddish Baruch has to be prepared to intervene in the world also, which gives this whole category of hashkacha. In other words, if we want a, what we might describe as a coherent emuna, any coherent emuna in a creator is going to require these three categories. First of all, the creator exists. Second of all, if he exists, he's existing with a purpose. Man is part of that world, therefore we need direction, which means communication, nevuah, Torah min And finally, Kaddish Baruch Hu's intervention, both to make our actions meaningful, reward and punishment, but also to ensure that the world reaches its final goal, hashkacha, and all the different things that come under that. Okay, anyway, just that's kind of like the big picture. We're now transitioning from the first category that has to do with the existence of the Kaddish Baruch Hu, into the second category, which has to do with the nature of communication with man. And our focus now is specifically on Samuna. According to this, really, the focus, of the, the understanding of what, why it's necessary that there should be a Muna, and therefore why we should be required to believe in the existence of a Muna to have a complete Muna, uh, is because it is, the, it is the means, it's the conduit, to which we get the content of the Torah. <clears throat> we can use that also just to understand so the idea of tochacha, which is the idea that Kaddish Baruch was giving us a certain amount of guidance along the way also, that all fits into the same category, that nefua is for the purpose of what it is that we're being told, which would seem to be an obvious statement, but actually that's not a complete picture of nefua. It's clear from the psukim that the purpose of Navua is ultimately to connect us back to our Sinai. This is a point that Ramosh Shapiro made on many, many different occasions, right? We see that it, it, it's there, it's there to, effectively, it's a continuation of the voice of the Kaddish Baruch going all the way back to the first two Dibras and the Eser, Eser Dibras that we heard on our Sinai. Gorn Makos, famous Gorn Makos, teaches us that and it's derived directly from the Pesukim. If you look at the Pesukim carefully by the Esser Dibras, by the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments are spoken in the first po- person. Anochi, Hashem Alekecha, I am the Lord your God. Elohim acherim al pana, you won't have other gods on my face. It's spoken in the first person voice, which the more understands that we heard those first Dibros, those first statements directly from Kaddish Baruch Hu, right? The rest of the Dibros are going to third person, which means that now Moshe becomes the spokesman for the different Dibros. The Medrash explains that the whole point, you, again, you see this to a story, if you read the Pesukim carefully, that the experience on Har Sinai was absolutely overwhelming. According to the Medrash, when the Kaddish Baruch Hu said the Dibor Anoche Shalom Kecha, all the Kol Yisrael died. It was so overwhelming of an experience, right? They were brought back to life again. They heard the second deeper, the second thing happens. I always, I, I apologize for this imagery, but it is helpful. Um, if any of you, I mean, I'm sure I, uh, there's a, a famous uh, movie from Pixar called A Bug's Life. And there's a scene in there where the mosquitoes are being attracted toward the violet, you know, bug killer that where the, those little lights that they get sapped and like, and the mosquitoes going, it's so beautiful. And uh, there you go. So anyway, I, I, I apologize for bringing it down to this level, but that's always, I always think of a bug's life when I think of Harsina. I, I guess that's not everybody's image, but the point is, Kaddish Baruch reveals himself with such clarity that our neshama basically cannot remain within our individual being and is flies back to a Kaddish Baruch and basically needs to be reunited with our individuality, bringing us back to our individual life. And then that happens a second time in the second Dibor. You're so beautiful. And, uh, and again, Akash Baruch to bring us back to the bottom line that the Medrash has made, the point the Medrash is making over there is this was a, just an incredibly, incredibly overwhelming experience. And the Pesukim and Eschanan tell us that we turned to Moshe Rabbeinu and we said, you know, uh, to paraphrase, you know, this is really fun, but maybe you'll get the rest of the risk and you'll give them to us, right? We actually said to him, right, 
Ki Mikol, we, we, we now know that, uh, that we're able to hear the living voice of God, but now, you know, why do we need, why do we need to die in this pro- process? Karab Ata Vishama is Kol Asher Yomar Hashem Elokeinu, right? And then you're going to speak to us. You get close to Kesh Baruch, you hear what he has to say, and then you convey to us what it is that he wants to say. In other words, we asked that Moshe Rabbeinu be introduced as an intermediary between us and the direct communication of a Kaddish Baruch, which was a, a move that a Kaddish Baruch himself endorsed, actually. But the point is now, if we move to Parsha Shoftim, which is the Parsha where Nebu is really being discussed over there, we're told is, Navi v'kir becha me'achecha kamoni yokim l'cha Hashem, elokecha. A Navi from your midst, right, like me, a Kaddish Baruch will raise up and you'll listen to him, kechol asher sha'alt me'im Hashem elokecha, Bechare, just like you asked on Harsinai, meaning that when Klon Yisrael said enough, we can't hear directly from Kaddish Baruch Moshe Rabbeinu, you be the middleman, effectively, and the Ramban says this explicitly, it was a request, it was a request for the rest of time that we would need some kind of an intermediary, some intermediary to convey the living words of the Kodesh Baruch to us. Really the, and, and that's what Nevu is. Nevu is effectively a continuation of the role of Moshe as an intermediary to bring to us the actual voice of Kodesh Baruch What you basically get from this is, ideally, if you can ca- talk in such terms, Right, the intention was that a Kaddish Baruch Hu would would speak directly to us. All of the Torah, the entire Torah, would have been spoken to us directly. It's and you see that also. Moshe Shapiro cited the the, the Psukim in Bamidbar when uh, when Moshe said he couldn't handle it anymore. He needed some assistance from the Chachamim, and some of the Nevuah should go to them. And we have these two that that, that weren't chosen yet. They had it. Moshe Beno says, you know, would that it were. That Vayomer lo Moshe hamikane atali umi ten kol amashem nevim. Would that you, you you're, you're jealous of me? He said to Yeshua. Would that it would be that all of Klal Yisrael would be nevim, right? The ideal would have been that a kosher bar would have communicated with all of us directly. Interestingly enough, it's very similar to the uh, to the model that Korach was uh, was 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 advocating for. But the whole point with the reason why Karak was so convincing is when that declaration that it should be lightweight has a certain accuracy to it. There is a level of reality in which Kajabra does and should speak to us directly, but the bottom lines were not on that level. That's why we requested to change it. That's why Kajabra endorsed that request. We are not on that level. It's not appropriate. <coughs> we need to have the Torah f- filtered to us, th- to us through an individual that's on a higher level th- than us. And that's what the that's what Navu is. Navu is effectively that middleman who's continuing what should be. Or is, it's really the it's the it's a it's a it's an attenuated version of a direct con- conversation between Kadesh Baruch Hu and Kol Yisrael. But when we say that Navu connects us back to that moment and to that voice, what exactly is it that we're connecting up to? That's the question, right? On the most obvious level, we'd say that we need to get, we need instructions, like we were saying before. That would seem to be obvious, but it's clear that that is not the complete picture. I mean, if you just think back for a moment to the, your, your Seder on Pesach, right, which is actually now starting to approach rather quickly. But when we finally get to the Dayenu, when we feel like the, we're, we've almost made it to the meal, right, everyone's waking up. But we have two Dayenas over there. If you, we say, if you brought us before Harsino, Dayenu, if you just brought us to Harsino with Dayenu, and then we say, if you'd given us the Torah, it would have been Dayena. Always, always very, you know, most people, when you come to that, it's always like, well, what's going on? What do you mean if you brought us Tarsina and not given us the Torah? What's the whole point of bringing us Tarsina if you're not going to give us the Torah? What we understand from this is the actual immediacy of connection, awareness to a Kodesh Baruch Hu in and of itself, quite apart from the content that was conveyed, the actual words of Torah, the information we got, is of significance. It's not just of, I mean, when you think about it, really, I mean, there wasn't really all that much content that we got at Harsinai in any case, 
But actually, you see, if you look carefully, you see that the emphasis is actually much more on the closeness that was achieved in that moment, Arnstino, even more than the content itself. Shir Shirim, the second Pasuk in Shir Shirim, Yishikani Minashiko Spihu Kiko Tovim Dodecha Miyayim. Kiss me, it's call yourself in Golas, looking back on the past. Intimacy with the Kaddish Baruch who cries out, Yishikani Minashiko Spihu. Would that once again you would kiss me with the kisses of your mouth because they're even better than your love. Before the, the Medrash over there explains that the kisses that it's talking about are the two Dibras that we heard directly from Kaddish Baruch Hu, which we're describing here as Nashikos, as kisses of the Kaddish Baruch Hu, that's better than Dodecha, that's better than your love, which the Dodecha is actually referring to the Torah and its content. According to the Gro, this Pasek is the one that conveys the essence of what happened on Harsinai. And what we're describing over there is not the content of the Torah that we receive, but the indescribable closeness, that moment of closeness that was achieved when we actually heard a Kaddish Baruch was speaking directly to us with no intermediary whatsoever. And certainly what happened in that moment, we were changed for eternity by that experience. Right? When the matters we recited before that talks about the fact that we died in the moment of hearing these dibras, what it really means is all facets of our personality that were not fully focused on the relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu were burned off. Any aspect of self that wasn't directed towards that relationship with Hashem was lost. What happened in those moments, in those two dibras, is the essential, the essence of the Torah personality was created. And nation that was formed around and exclusively around its relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's what that moment, it was a moment, in certain sense, a moment of birth, it's a moment of tshuva, it's a moment of definition of self. Obviously, we all struggle with the fact that we're not realizing that level of self, but it will forever be the essential self of calling Yisrael, and the fact that it's there will always exercise a certain pull upon our personality and always remains a resource to return to, which can be the basis of our spiritual development. That's there and it was created in that moment. And when it says, share, share, my share, share, you should can't even she goes, when we, when we hunger for a return to that moment, we're hungering for that extraordinary closeness, that moment when almost the distinction between calling someone and Kodesh Baruch Hu on a certain level began to break down, but certainly, any aspect of us that wasn't fully focused around that connection and defined around that connection was completely lost. We have a mitzvah, well, whatever, they're looking at Zvarim. The Ramban learns that we have a mitzvah not to forget the experience of Harsina. The Ram, Ram, Rambam does not list it as a separate mitzvah, but all the portion explain the Rambam doesn't disagree with the Ramban that we have an obligation to remember that experience on Harsina but it's just a dispute of whether it's a distinct mitzvah or it's actually contained within the general mitzvah of Talmud Torah. But what is it that we're remembering? There wasn't a lot of content at that point. It was the experience. And the real essence of that experience was the closeness that was achieved. One place where you see this actually is if you think about it, right, in the, in the Siddur, when we make the, the second bracha, of Kriyach Maho, Bocher Ba'amo Yisrael Bi'ahava, when we're making that bracha, that bracha actually is, can be, can sometimes a bracha for Birkas Torah, right? Birkas Torah is, is a derisa, is a Torah obligation. We have to make a bracha on the Torah. This thing, a bocher ba'amah Yisrael ahava, which doesn't mention Torah at all. <laughs> it's a bracha on Torah. The one that cho chooses the Jewish people in love, right? Through love, that's a bracha on Torah. The reason is because Torah actually, what Torah actually is, is a medium of connection between the Jewish people and the Kodesh Baruch Hu. In a certain sense, the cont even the content, if we understand it really deeply enough, the content of Torah also is really just, is, is a vehicle, a medium of connection between Kodesh and the Kodesh Baruch Hu. But the point I'm just trying to make is that, that if we're saying that Navua, the purpose of Navua is connecting us back Ultimately, to that moment of those two voices, those, those two dibras that Akash Barma spoke to us directly, right? We said, we can't handle this. Let Moshe be the conduit for that Torah. Now we find out that Nebu is the continuing 
conduit for those voices that that voice that we heard directly on Harsina, right? Navua is a continue is it retains our connection back to that moment and the significance of the moment is not so much the content of the Torah that was reading at the time, but actually the supreme closeness between Kali Son and Kadesh Baruch Hu that moment. Really, I guess the I, I, the idea that I think is like this is that you know it's a relationship. This is a really the 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 the, dom- the the ultimate metaphor for the relation between the Jewish people and the Kaddish Baruch is the one that's used in Shir Hashirim. That's the that's the sefer that's called Kodesh Gedoshim of all Tanakh. Right? The, the, it's the holy of holies of all of Tanakh, and it uses the metaphor of Chas and Kal of husband and wife for the relation between Kol Yisrael and Kaddish Baruch And you understand that that relationship is built on the achievement of that singular closeness in, between the two, between with the couple where they ultimately become a single in a single entity called the couple right it's like the word adam means husband and wife together a man is a is a half of a person and a woman is a half a person the couple is where we get something called adam right and that relation of chas and kala is the relationship to which they become fused or unified into this single individual right well that's also that basically that's what's happening in harsini also becoming fused as a single entity klal yisrael and kaddish baruch and the point is, obviously, in any relationship, you can't be focused around that level of closeness. In the context of Kali Shalom Kadesh Barucho, we're totally paralyzed in the moment of that complete and utter dvekas in a Kadesh Barucho. We're paralyzed. We can't operate. We can't do. We can't use our free will. We can't build it. We can't develop ourselves. We can't develop our world. So we can't be frontally conscious of that level of closeness with any kind of constancy. But the relationship is always built on the fact that, that that closeness exists. And then essentially on a certain level, we always need to be referencing back to it and reconnecting to that moment to, re, to, re, to, to that it should always be. And uh, it's like the it's the heart. It's the heart of the relationship. Right. There's a lot of other components besides the heart. Without the heart, you don't have anything. Right. It's a, it's a, it's we can't live in the. It's like it can't be constantly in the ram. Can't we can't be frontally conscious of this level of closeness, but we can never let it stray to the point where we aren't con- we, 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 we're, where it isn't exercising its influence over the ongoing reality of the relationship. And that's where the obligation comes to always re- to remember every day, Harsinai. And what we're saying is basically Navua. And what we're coming to say now is the purpose of Navua. Right, is to retain that ongoing direct. It's like we, we remain in direct conversation with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Obviously, not with the intensity of those first two dibros. Right, that in a certain level, that was Moshe Rabbeinu, and that'll be for the next speaker to, to 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 explain what the distinction and the uniqueness of Moshe was. But the Navi is effectively continuing. That personal conversation between Queen Kali Yisrael and a, and a Kaddish Baruch Hu, meaning through him we retain that certain intimacy of connection. We have, for example, we we, all, we see this in another way. The uh, the 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 Ner Maravi in the Mishkan and the Beis Hamikdash, the Ner Maravi, which was that we have the we had the menorah, right? The more the menorah we, we that was was lit every day and, and burned through the night. But even though only enough oil was put in. Burned through the night. There was one of those seven branches that burned all the way till the relighting of the candles the next days. The near tummy, and the, that that nace, that nace, the Medrash tells us is a dut is edus. The fact that the shchina continues to dwell in Kol Yisrael, right? It's an edus. It's a testimony. To the fact that we retain Kaddish Baruch Hu dwells with us, we are together. Now, why is that relevant? It's relevant because the Maharal tells us that it's through that near Maravi, through that near Tamid, that Navua flows into the Jewish people. Meaning that just as that near Maravi is, was a constant nace, so also. Navua, which comes to us from a realm which transcends that of phys- physicality and physical causality, it comes through a longer discussion. The, 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 the menorah represents human wisdom, Torah Shabbat, Pet, whatever, longer discussion. But the bottom line is that the, 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 the very thing which testifies 
to the presence of the Shekhin and Kol Yisrael is the conduit through which there is a flow of Nevuah into the Jewish people. Now, Rabbi Foxburner, when he when he asked me to to to, to give this talk, and he he mentioned that it you know it would it would be kind of nice if you put uh, something practical into the talk. Uh, so that leaves me at a on a certain level a little bit of a loss here because we're talking about Nevua, and the the Talmud tells us multiple multiple occasions we don't have Nevua anymore. <laughs> it's gone, right? It's uh, uh, that's it's a longer discussion that we hold class in its own right. And was interested in sort of understanding. The history behind this and why it makes sense on a hashkoch, on a hashkocha basis, why it is that we should be going through a process like this. Um, you're, you're welcome to take a look at my books. It's a school to have one at least one copy in every room, whatever. At least it's a school for me. Anyway, if you're interested in that, that that's over there. That's not so much our topic. But where does that leave us? In a certain sense, also, it's, it's not just that that we're having difficulty finding practical application for the for the for the class over here. But but the whole point is, I'm what we're saying over here is that nevua is essential to the ongoing relationship between Kuala Yisrael and Kaddish Baruch because it is effectively the expression of the direct connection, the ongoing link, the intimate connection between Kuala Yisrael and Kaddish Baruch which goes through, which we, which we need to go through the end of time. It's the whole reason why I have Nebu at all continuous. It's it, it continuing the voice that we heard on our Sinai. We need that, just like we have a mitzvah to remember our Sinai. Right, and it was there to continue the personal conversation, right? That that's basically. So, what does it mean to us? What does that mean now that when we say we don't have Nivu anymore, which is a, it's one hundred percent clear the Gemara, we don't have it anymore. So the answer is the famous Gemara in Baba Basa, which is often cited, which tells us that even though Nivu was taken from the Nadim, it was not taken from the Chachamim. Famous Ramban there explains what this means is. The Chachamim, their intuition as to what is the correct answer, when you have a couple of different ways of interpreting something, the intuition of what the correct one is, is actually a hidden form of Navua. Now, we're not talking about sort of each and every individual in his personal learning that whatever idea he has about the Gemara necessarily is a prophetic insight. What we're talking about here is those individuals who have transformed themselves into vessels of the truth of Torah, vessels of service to the Kaddish Baruch Hu, vessels of service to the Jewish people who really sort of, who have changed their individuality from an ego to a unique expression of man's connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, someone who has dedicated themselves on that level, then they effectively become an instrument of the Torah and their intuition about what's correct and what's not correct has a prophetic quality to it. Rav Tzodek actually says that it's the same as the same, it's the same path through which Nevoa passed the Nevim. It's just that we're now in a time when when all this stuff is much more hidden. We're much more, more, much more deeply entrenched in the physical reality of our, the physical dimension of our being. So things that that, that spiritual side is much more hidden. So we don't see the path by which this insight comes to us. We don't recognize it's a direct. It's coming direct. It's a direct influence from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. But it's actually coming from that source. We just we experience it as that as that inspiration. What we call the aha. What we said about what the aha moment before, but not an aha moment just from some sometimes some 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 higher space of human intellect, but rather something which is coming from that transcendent realm. That's also reinforced by the fact that the uh, you know Navua went out at the same time that we lost the nace of the near Maravi, I mean, the near Tummy. I mean, that uh, through, the, through the first, for the, for the 40 years when Shimon Tzadik was with Koen Gadol in the second temple, the, that, that candle on the menorah burned miraculously every night through to, the next, through, through, through to the next lighting, meaning much longer than what should have been based on the amount of oil that was put in there. When you put in enough oil just to burn through the darkness, and yet it burned 24, 25 hours straight through to the time when you, when you, that happened every day constantly, as long as Shimon Tzadik was there. But when Shimon Tzadik, when Shimon Tzadik passed away, which is the same time that Nevu was passing away, he was the last member of the Man of the Great Assembly, the last board that had prophets on them. When he passed away, that went out. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but it's no longer a testimony to the presence of the Gersh because it's not constant, right? 
Nevo went out when we lost that near Tamid. We got the equivalent of that near Tamid back on Hanukkah. The nace of Hanukkah was basically a revisiting of the nace of the near Tamid for the rest of history. In other words, we reconnect to that near Tamid every Hanukkah when we brought, when we light our menorah and we connect ourselves back to that nace Hanukkah where we had enough oil for one day and actually burned for eight days. That since that near Hanukkah is Hanukkah, it was the dedication of Bayesheni at that point. We're sort of dedicating it with this nace of Shemin. It's a uh, Hanukkah connects us up for the rest of history to the nace of the near tummy. This was a point that Ramosh Shapiro made. And the point is Hanukkah is really, and this is a longer discussion, but Hanukkah is really this, is really uh, celebrating the, the the really the coming to the fore of the Torah Shabal path. Uh, with Navu is completely gone now, and and Torah Shabal Peh, meaning the Chachamim have now become the the arbiters of Torah for us completely, and Hanukkah sort of inaugurates this point in history where the Ner Maravi, the Ner Tamid, the nace of the Ner Tamid, transfers from being a conduit for direct revealed Navua to the hidden Navua of the inspiration and the intuition of the Chacham. So what I'm saying is that Navua is still with us. We haven't lost Navua. It comes in a much more subdued form. It doesn't change the fact that it is Navua, right? And we can connect ourselves to it. What's the, the practice? Of, we need to connect ourselves. The way we connect ourselves up to it is that, you know, you have a rabbi and you, first, you learn to your, whatever Torah learning, whatever dedication you have to your learning of Torah, and you connect yourself to, to your Rav, someone who is more involved and more connected than you, and he's connected to his Rav up the ladder until you get to these, get, get the, the, get the leaders of the generation, the upper echelon, where these people who are these, who have turned themselves into genuine vehicles for the truth of Torah, and therefore have access to this level of intuition, which is in fact Nevoah. It's a hidden Nevoah, but it is Nevoah, and it is Nevoah. There's a famous story about Ramosha Feinstein that, uh, that, you know, some years after the war, a woman once, once came to him completely broken and distraught, saying that she'd been in one of the camps during the war and her husband had disappeared. And in that camp with her was a certain individual, one of the Gedolim Gidola, of that generation. And she had gotten, for, she'd asked from him permission to be able to remarry, even though her husband was disappeared and they didn't have testimony that he died. She was sure that he hid. There, there was a certain pro- halakhic process for doing this. He had certified it. Now, some, 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 some years later, after remarrying, her husband, her original husband shows up and she's completely broken. Say, Ramosha, what am I, Ramosha Feinstein, what am I supposed to do? I don't know if I, Ramosha Feinstein. So he says, tell me the story again. And she's just getting more emotional. Saying, you don't understand. I was in the camp. My husband disappeared. Such and such a devil was with me. He gave me permission to be married. Be married. Now my husband showed up. What am I supposed to do? And he says, "Tell me that story again." And she's getting just more and more emotional. Why are you doing this to me? I was in this camp. Da, da, da. He said, "You're lying. I've written hundreds of those documents allowing women to remarry. I have never been wrong." I know that I knew that man that you're talking about. He was a genuine tzaddik. If he had, if he had written that document, he would not have signed that document unless it was in fact true. You're lying. She broke down and she admitted that she was lying, that she had fabricated the story because she felt that her husband was gone and she wanted to remarry and whatever. But I'm just, I'm bringing this up to illustrate that Navua, something smacking of Navua, this aspect of Navua is an ongoing need. Uh, for the Jewish people to be able to be who they need to be in history. And we have, it still remains an ongoing part of Kong Yisrael. And we can connect ourselves up to that through our, our own connection to Torah, to, the, to our own Rebbeim, and through their connection of them to their Rebbeim up the line to these individuals. We have, we can, Kong Yisrael has, retains their connection to this. Now, the interesting thing is, in, in the, the story that I'm giving from for, for Moshe Feinstein, that's really talking about Nivu in terms of its content. But it's just as appropriate to talk about not just the content, but also that closeness 
that we are able to achieve in terms of a sense of connectedness to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, that sort of the love, which is the heart of this Chas and Kala relationship, we also have access to that. That we, at least we can get an echo of it. There's a famous Rashi in Parsis Kisisa, it's coming up next week, talking about the Betzalel, who was given a certain level of wisdom to be able to build the Mishkan, which was the microcosm of, of the creation, whatever, Chachm Bina and Das. So Rashi gives us a definition over there of, the, the, of Das, the kind of knowledge called Das. He says it's Ruach HaKodesh. You know, what we spoke about at the very, very beginning of the talk, which was the first level before you go up to Nevoa of uh, being able to get uh, divine inspiration on a certain level. He says Das is, div- is divine inspiration. It's sort of, it's like qu- almost quasi Nevoa. It's not exactly Nevoa, but it's like, it's like the next thing, the last thing up the ladder before you come to Nevoa. Das is the highest form of wisdom. And what Das is, is when you understand something on such a level that is completely and utter, utterly integrated into you as a person. The way that Ramush Shapiro used to, to, to explain it is an understanding that if you didn't have it, you would no longer recognize yourself. That's called Das. That's your Das. That's not, that's, it's like, it's like, if, 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 there's a, if there's an aspect of Torah that, that you just, you go over and over and over so you understand it completely from all the angles and it becomes an integral part. I'm not talking about something that you just know very well and whenever you have to re- refer to it, you can remember it. If you have to remember it, then it's your, not your das. We're talking about something that's an integral part of the structure of your consciousness. If you can work on some understanding of the Torah to the, to the point where it becomes so integrated into you, that's called das. When a person achieves that level of das, the reason why Rashi refers to it as Ruch Kodesh is because that allows you to achieve a kind of an intuition. In a certain sense, what it means is that understanding, the conscious part of your mind now becomes connected to your nisham, which transcends your own understanding. And since that knowledge is so, is so connected to that nishama, it actually allows you to resonate with that and access intuition and understanding, which goes beyond your own human capability. There's a certain sense of confidence, there's a certain strength in the experience of that understanding, which is an echo of the experience of Ruach HaKodesh, and therefore an echo of an echo of Navua. That, uh, that sense of, of, of really losing yourself in an idea which is larger than you, that connects you up to the understanding of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. There's an image in the Yerushalmi, when the Kodesh Baruch was giving the Torah to Moshe, of, of they said the luchos, the tablets are six tvachim long. There were two tvachim that were in the hands of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. There were two tvachim, two, two handbrakes that were hands of Moshe, and there were two in between. It actually recalls a Gemara in Bab Metzia about two people that are fighting over a talus. They, they're both holding a talus and claiming it's theirs. Whatever's in the hand of one that belongs to him, whatever's in the hand of the other belongs to him. And the two in the middle are jointly owned, owned and the psak is you, yachloku, you divide it. But the image of Kadesh Baruch Hu holding two handbreadths of the tablets and Moshe holding two with the area in between, what that image really means is that through the Torah, we're actually connected directly to a Kadesh Baruch There's an aspect of it that we understand. That's the two tefachim that are in the hand of Moshe. There's an aspect that is completely beyond us. They're in the hands of a Kadesh Baruch Hu. And then the two tefachim, the two handbreadths in between is an area that we our understanding is connected to, even though we don't fully grasp it, and it's and that itself is connected to something which goes even beyond that. That's like this chain of being between what we grasp all the way up to a Torah, which it belongs to a Kaddish Baruch Hu himself. Torah is this medium of connection, like we we're saying before about the Birkas Torah. It's a medium of connection, and if you can make Torah not something that you know, but something that you are. That's a way that we have a, the capability of, in a certain sense, bonding ourselves to the, and the experience of having that kind of understanding and what comes along with it is just, it's an echo of an echo of that sort of the intimacy of connection that was afforded by Navua, bringing us back to that essential memory and awareness of just how deeply and intimately connected we are to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. When we're talking about Navua and the obligation member Nevua, uh, of, of, of believing in Navua, it's an essential component of a complete and coherent 
emuna because this emuna is our emuna in a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and it includes within it not just the fact that Kaddish Baruch Hu exists, but our unique relation to Kaddish Baruch Hu as the Jewish people. And Navua is the is the conduit for the deepest level of connection, which is the beating heart of our ongoing historical relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Okay, thank you, Ray Foxburner, for the opportunity, and thank you all. Bye bye. From Jerusalem.